devices. Okay, I think we're ready to start. You guys ready? Ken, we're Tipu? Ready. We are. Our th I think everybody who's attending the webinar is ready. Good morning. I'm David Helbron. Um, with me is Tipu Riaz, who is running our CPG group here at HL. Good morning, Tipu. Good morning, David. And Ken Blanchett, our very special guest, who is a, a renowned food consultant. He's worked uh, at Fresh Direct. He works domestically. He works with foreign food manufacturers and in, in retail and food service uh, distribution channels. And he just, he knows the industry like no one else. And we're, we're really happy to have you, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I'm going to turn it over to Tipu. I'll, I'll, I'll tell our attendees that you can ask questions whenever you want. I'm going to be manning the mic and also reading your questions when I think they make sense. So you don't have to wait till the end. You can just send me your messages and I'll, I'll slide them in when they're um, relevant. So we're going to start with Tipu, uh, who's going to talk about CPGs and, and we're at stage one now. This is You've got an idea, you think you might have a product. We want to tell you what you should be thinking about, how to choose that product to make sure it's the right one. So Tipu, you wanna start CPGs from plate to package? Super, thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and for those who joined us in June for our, our inaugural webinar, thank you for doing that and thanks for joining us again. And um, Alex, if you want to turn the page real quick, uh, quick legal disclaimer, as, as, as always, what we're offering today is not legal advice. If you'd like legal advice, just reach out to us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the easiest answer for that disclaimer. Um, and we will move on from the disclaimer. And so uh, again, so David introduced Ken. Um, Ken and I worked together for over 10 years. Ken was in the merchandising division of Fresh Direct and he is now um, Ken Blanchett Consultants um, working on uh, working with companies from idea through getting them onto retail shelves. Um, and so he is a very good friend. He has one of the best palettes uh, I know of. He is a person who thoroughly understands every aspect of uh, food and beverage and how they um, how they interact with the consumer marketplace. And so it was, it's always been a pleasure uh, to work with him. He uh, is passionate about the industry. He loves it um, just like I do. And so we share that. And so it's always been uh, great fun, even if we weren't working on something together to, to just, you know, uh, be a part of his knowledge. And so with that, what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of talk about a very an issue that we have been speaking with our clients over the summer about since we've launched this program, is that there are some folks who have a very crystal clear idea of a product they want and who are running with it. Uh, they may have it already and it may be on retail stores. Uh, retail store shelves. And then we have also spoken with clients who um, are struggling a little, little bit with what should the product be, what will the market take, and what should they do. So today we want to help focus our discussion about this. We want folks to ask questions continually. We want this to be a discussion. Um, and what we would like to talk about and have this discussion about is helping folks kind of focus on that today. Um, we're not going to talk too much about other things like getting onto a shelf today or things like that, but instead we want to talk about um, how we can develop a product that will ultimately get there. Because without the, pro the product is, in my opinion, the most important item that we need. It is, it is obviously, it is material to moving forward with anything else. And so um, let's get started. Ken, welcome. Good morning, Tipu. How are you doing? We are good. Um, so I think we're just going to go back and forth on this issue. Um, and so I think, Ken, if you want to start with your ideas of how people come to product selection, keeping in mind that we have a lot of clients who are going to be on this phone call who are restaurateurs currently. And so they are in the world of a la minute cooking and doing things like that. And so 
and we'll just kind of go through that and have a discussion. Sure. Um, I think uh, we can walk through the the first slide as just a uh, uh, a path to generate some conversation here. But uh, I always believe uh, you know that you should uh, work with a product that's from the heart. You should love what you want to show the world, and it's a pass. So it's a passion product, but it should also be something that shows an opportunity in the marketplace. Um, is there a place for it? Are you going to show something that is, you know, best in class? Are you going to have a take on it that is your own that says, uh, "This is this is my statement, and I want to I want to show this uh, to you and 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 make uh, this point." It, uh, if you're just looking for an economic opportunity and you don't have um, either the faith or the background or uh, the passion to get it there, it may fall short. You, you should first feel that this is something you really want to bring to market uh, with the understanding that there are trends in the marketplace. Those things I'm sure you've seen in, in your own restaurants and, uh, and that's towards a, a clean product. Organic now is almost table stakes, uh, although you can get away with having something that's a so-called all natural uh, product. Uh, but having products that are or have clean ingredients that uh, speak to uh, the customer in the way they're going and the, 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 the direction uh, in any uh, uh, retail facility and, and as well as food service is having something that uh, you can uh, feel very comfortable uh, giving to your family. So uh, I, I think the lifestyle issues, health and wellness um, are a big deal. And when I'm looking for something on the shelf, it should also reach a certain level of uh, culinary excellence. You should be looking uh, to send something off that uh, really makes a point about how well you've thought about this. Uh, having a thoughtful product is, I think, key to uh, being successful in the retail arena. And I think one way to sum up what you just said is that it's important for the product to, just like many folks here with their restaurants, it's important for the products to have a point of view. And that, Absolutely. that there is a statement being made with the product. Um, and I think that you can also, not only those items you're looking at, like trends and all of that, it's also you consider what is, and then you how you consider those items is what type of ingredients you're going to consider placing into these products. Whether Can you give me an example, Tipu or Ken, of an item that you think is backed by passion or, Tipu, as you said, has a point of view? I mean, our, our clients love their products. I don't think passion is going to be such an issue. But what about point of view? What does that even mean? That means that, that uh, for me, it means that what, what you've introduced uh, I know from its style, it's it's you know, not just the the uh, method in which it's gotten to market, but that uh, when I taste this thing, I know that someone thought about how this is put together. And that second product and third product should be uh, very well linked in that way. I can tell you when I was looking for product, when I was doing uh, sourcing, international sourcing at Fresh Direct, uh, it wasn't a, a, about finding the, the most extreme in any particular area, but finding something that uh, had some historical value. And there was a, uh, there was a line from uh, how this thing started to where it was today. And it could have changed all along the way and it should have changed, but you could see a direct link to its core. That's one thing. And then you can make it your own with, whether it's a, a taste in, uh, the quality of ingredients or uh, the, the taste profile, but it became obvious on, on tasting this thing that it was um, uh, it had roots and it had a point of view that uh, Tip was talking about, and that can be in taste profile and in quality of the goods. And, and I taste think profile and quality. Do you have an example, Tipu, of something that has that. a point of view? Hundred percent, and I think that this is some. This is a product that everyone's familiar with and has become familiar with it recently in the marketplace over the last few years. Is the I think the Flyby Jing, uh, brand of Chili Crisp, that came onto the marketplace, 
they are not the they did not invent it they are not the people who came up with it this is a very old product that has existed in the far east for a very long time however what they did by through their branding and through their quality has kind of helped add and and you and I think this always goes to a statement that we speak to the clients about is that every category in a grocery in, in the grocery space is constantly being reinvented and that folks should never feel that there's a space that can't be can't be touched. For example, the the entire Chili Crisp and Fly by Jing, in addition to other brands that are now there, have shown that you can bring a spicy condiment that was not really on the shelves prominently into the marketplace. And now it is sitting right beside your Mexican hot sauces, your American hot sauces like Tabasco and things of that nature. And it fits in seamlessly. So I think David, I think that's that is a that is a product that we see very much so in the shelves that has done this. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, could, you, could, you can see that throughout the whole condiment uh, offering. I mean, uh, whether it's the, the the mayo or ketchup uh, industry. I mean, and how now uh, the, the 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 big guys have have taken up under under their wing or co opted to some degree. The the people have come in uh, uh, with with their alternative products that are now you know owned and run by the big guys. Uh, it's so if it, you're it's, doing a gelato or you're doing a pizza or you're doing a salsa or a hummus, you, what you're saying is you can't just throw it onto the shelves. It has to have a point of view and people will know if it does, if there's passion behind it. Is that what you're saying? On my side, David, abs absolutely. Absolutely, uh, okay. And and you you mentioned areas that are all ripe for you know better than products on the shelf. And with hummus, whether that's textural issues to show that some one thought about that because much of what we see on the shelf in, in that particular product is fully homogenized and made into pablum. Uh, so there is a, a space for that and many other products that you'd say, you know, it's it's that's been done and gone. Look at the snack industry, especially during the pandemic. It blew up. It was unbelievable how many things came to market that were uh, traditional, made more uh, uh a mass market for the American palate, but was still very delicious. And you could see where it came from, right? Um, there are many examples within uh, that group. So uh, almost anything you can think of has a place to go. There will, will be a continuum, there will be a trajectory, and yours can be that thing that is the next big hit. I've seen it again and again. And there are lots of places that will bring this on and uh, uh, make a point of bringing new things into the market uh, before others. Uh, you know, there are many, uh, you know, especially large chains that want to be last in line or someplace in the middle to see what the uh, the ROM is doing. But um, uh, there are many okay. people that, that will bring it up. Thank you, Tipu. You want to continue and, and yeah, talk no, about think, opportunity I... in the marketplace? I think we understand passion and point of view pretty well. Yeah. And I think what folks, I mean, when you're, when you're looking at that opportunity, I think as you look to the left of that slide, um, whether, you know, the point of view can be taking a product that is um, a traditional product that's existed. And then you are doing uh, the way you are manufacturing it or the ingredients you are using are going to trigger certain claims or certifications that could, could be an angle that a product doesn't necessarily have. And so very common one that we're familiar with would be organic. Um, or to make something that has traditionally incorporated dairy products to make it vegan. And, and mm -hmm. so that is, that is uh, still, I think, um, there has been a slight downward trend in animal, uh, in the, excuse me, plant protein meat products. Um, they, things like Impossible and things of that nature have slowed their sales. I think pandemic novelty had really ratcheted their interest up. But vegan-based products um, are still very popular because of all of the good-for-you elements, not just around the product itself, but also around uh, the manufacturing, sustainability components of using something that is 
uh, easily scalable, easily scalable ingredients that you are not doing harm to the environment. You are not doing harm via your packaging. And so thinking about things like that regarding your claims and certifications is still, I think it is a, it's very, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. I don't think it's an aspect that is going away. And so I think that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind as you start thinking about, as you're, as you're formulating an idea of what you'd like to see. Yeah, it feeds right into your your point of view. Um, you're adding labels, organic, vegan, whatever that is. Why don't you talk about opportunity in the marketplace? And so I think it's really I think for I think anybody who is contemplating getting into a CPG product needs to understand what is going on in the category that you are possibly exploring. And so it's a very luckily. It's a very easy thing to do. Um, and so I think that participating, uh, getting to know your competitor, essentially that's what you're doing. You may not have a product yet, but you may be a competitor to things. And so the easiest way to do it is to get into the marketplace and to be buying and experimenting with everything that's out there and finding those ones that are in big box stores all the way to those that are in more uh, niche or gourmet stores. Ken, you have something to say about researching on the the market? And I think it's 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 important to go to shop and taste. Absolutely, check out what's out there. Um, it will tell you something about direction, also, right? Um, and and as you noted, go to the smallest shops, go to you know, Whole Foods, go to the conventional markets, and see what's being moved into those those spaces and how quickly it is. We're in a great spot in New York. We, we live in a very independent marketplace and the rest of the country uh, is, 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 is more about the large markets. So you're in a, in a have an advantage to see what's happening here. Either coast has the same kind of advantage and that's, uh, you know, find out what's going on, what's coming in, whether it's import uh, or domestically driven uh, and taste away. It, it will be helpful for you to understand what, you know, if, if the thing that you're trying to bring to market has a real place. And Ken, yeah, I, I think assume uh, that uh, that advantage goes both ways, that not only can you go and see and taste, but then you also have the advantage of putting your product into some of these smaller stores, 100%, right? yes. I have a yes, question I, for you guys mm -hmm. from, from one of our um, viewers. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, for the webcast so far. Do you think there's an opportunity today in the premium segment of the frozen market? Are there consumers within big cities, metro areas, showing a tendency to pay up for premium frozen products if matched with high quality ingredients, taste, and health profile? And can you think of an example? You're asking me, uh, David. Yeah. So I would, uh, I, sure. I suggest, so I think that the frozen area is 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 ripe for uh, new products. There are so many things that are just a bit, um, you know, tired in the department and, and could use a, a facelift. I'd like to see more ethnic products overall, um, and I could pick various things. I was just working with a, a group, uh, a Greek group that has, you know, good. Uh, sales within the EU, and they're they're trying to come into market. And I found um, a good amount of interest in some of those authentic uh, items being moved into frozen because they're not more pricey, but they are more authentic and have better ingredients and and perform better than most of what you see in the uh, in that space. Um, with uh, uh, we talk about the, you know vegan burgers, you know not things that are manipulated like we talked about uh, just previously with with uh, beyond or impossible but um, things that are plant-based uh, truly plant-based and uh, just using those ingredients to to put them together without as much manipulation there's there's not as as much in there and i i'm working with someone who's doing more things with mushrooms in that regard and mushrooms themselves have gotten a uh, spotlight uh, about their health benefits and just being delicious. So there, there are avenues within frozen, absolutely. And I think that, uh, from my point of view, will be will be more on the ethnic side, uh, 
at this point, although I think there's opportunities throughout the case. That's great. Tipu, you want to talk about ingredients? Because Ken just started talking about some of these products that have better ingredients. How important is that when you have to consider what you're putting into your product? I think ingredients are, they're going to be exceptionally important. I think it, A, you're looking at your sourcing. So you're looking the so there's two issues. One is the consumer facing issue of what your product contains. And those are the, that's going to be captured in your labeling, your packaging and everything that you do. And so people pay attention. I would say that there is an increasing larger segment of the purchasing public who is paying attention to, to the packaging and to the ingredients of your product. And so that is, something that I don't believe is going to go down or decrease. And so that's exceptionally important. From a thinking down the road, from a production standpoint, the capacity to um, readily secure and source these products and source your ingredients is gonna be exceptionally important in relation to where you're manufacturing and how you're manufacturing. Ken, sure. you want to say a bit about that regarding sourcing of ingredients and the difficulties? It has so it, for for as long as I've you know been in this business, sourcing has been uh, a mainstay on the on the higher end uh, of this business, and in the past twenty years, it is tatamon. Within the last five years, it's it's just table stakes. You need to know where things come from. Sourcing is a, a big thing. And I, I see it in, in the trade press. I see it in, in uh, uh, consumer press. You see it in fashion magazine, uh, health magazines, men's health, women's health. This sourcing is key, period. Um, and as you note, uh, organic, uh, and, and from my point of view, especially on the shelf, things that are kosher, halal, are also a, a, a big issue. So uh, anything to do with it having uh, proper certifications, health benefits are big. And where does my X come from? You know, there you can get a QR code on the side of your jam that tells you which field it came from. I mean, there's there there. So uh, more and more, I think you're going to see uh, the the need for uh, things being properly sourced. That's not going away. And you're seeing that in a, a couple of ways. So I think the commodification of food, like how food was purchased 20, 30 years ago, where, you know, um, cereal A and cereal B were essentially the same. You know, you pick the one maybe based on price or things of that nature has has drastically changed. I think folks, I think with a lot of clients here who are in the restaurant industry here sitting on, on this call, you will see this in now major commodities of goods that travel on the market, such as nuts and spices. Spices, I think, is one area that I've been very happy to see that clean sourcing of spices has become a thing in the industry. And now you know where um, things such as cumin and other things have are, are coming from, where they're being sourced, who the person is growing it. And I think that's been a big change um, in a category that was traditionally known for sitting in warehouses for ages and being divvied up and being frankly pretty dirty of an industry. Um, and so seeing that in that way um, has been really great. So all the way down to the spice level, right? There has been um, this uh, focus on where things come from. In addition, regulations in the United States regarding sourcing and where your ingredients are coming from and certifications are part of the manufacturing process. In addition, um, especially if you're using uh, foreign sources, so outside of the United States, that you have to have certifications regarding those producers. So you end up having, so this kind of, this chain is starting to happen. And it's a good one. In my opinion, it's a good one as a consumer. Um, one other thing I just want to say is that for, uh, we touched on New York. Ken mentioned New York being a great location um, to be involved in, consumer packaged goods. New York is a trend-setting area of the world, uh, whether it be fashion or music or any other thing. And it's no different when it comes to food products. There are many food products that have started in, in New York and in New York City that have then grown and become national products. Um, one that just finally was fully sold off was uh, to the Mars uh, to Mars, the candy folks, 
was Kind Bars is an example of a New York City brand that started a long time ago that has finally now, I think, uh, done very well for its founder. He came in with a clear vision of a simpler, cleaner protein bar, uh, of a health bar, and it did great. And actually, I think over the summer, finally, he uh, they have sold the last bit of it off now. And so, but New York is a great location because people are willing to try things here, right? Just how they're willing to try things with clothes and music and restaurants. It's the, it extends directly to the grocery aisle. And so I think folks uh, on this phone call should feel, you know, amped up and psyched about the fact that you have a pretty interested audience for your products. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree. I'd say to the, to the point where uh, I wouldn't call it begging, but there's a lot of interest from buyers on the, on the cutting edge of, of, uh, of natural source businesses that want to see what's next. No two ways about it. And I, I deal you know, much in the, uh, in the natural arena, the natural stream, whether it's in food service or, or retail. That's a, you know, what's, what's next out there is a big thing. And, it, and you're, you're hitting it right on the head, uh, Tipu. Tipu, why don't you uh, take us through the next topic? Super. Let's, uh, I think, Alex, I think we, yeah, super. We can move to the next slide. So I think one of the areas is as, so what we've just spent time talking about is focusing on a point of view product and then the capacity to make that product and to start testing that idea. And so I think another aspect that David and I have encountered in speaking with clients over um, these past few months is that their folks have a concern about viability. You know, they would like to understand, like, if I'm going to make something, you know, is this going to work, which is a totally correct question. And we fully support all of the things that go around researching that idea. And so um, this is about testing your idea and how you can do that. And we'd like to spend some time talking about that. Um, and so I think a lot of folks here, I think, are going to have either they're in the food space or they have restaurants. And one thing that we are encouraging folks to do, if this product is an extension of your brand or connected to your restaurant, for example, is to utilize your captive audience of your customers who are your supporters um, to test this idea with folks and to refine this idea and to ask them uh, what they think of it. Um, I think sometimes it's funny, I think, um, when you are putting a product out into the consumer space, you want folks to want it and you want them to buy it. So getting consumer feedback, I think is really important. How do you get your customers to, to give you feedback? Like in a practical way, say you've got, uh, you've got a hummus in your, in your restaurant and it's part, it's on the menu, that hummus. And you want to package that hummus just like it is on your menu. How are you getting feedback other than sales reports from your clients? I think you can. So I think for, for the idea that we've been speaking with clients about is to take that hummus and to take these products and to remove it from the dining area, you know, and to really focus in and have a focus group with folks in your area. You're very fortunate if you have a kitchen that can produce these products for you in New York City, right? So right there, mm -hmm. you're outside of a home kitchen. You're not having to go to a co-packing kitchen or one of uh, the shared kitchen service uh, places to do this right off the bat. And so what we're trying to find, get folks to do is to take that initial step, right? To take that initial kind of like, there's sometimes there's a barrier from going from, you know, the a la minute service to providing it to your customers. And so trying to get folks to feel comfortable to use their restaurants to do that. And to that's how I would recommend that you do it is, it, is to not treat it like a dining item, but to instead to take your folks, to take your, your customer base and to say, hey, do you mind joining us for a sampling of products? Some free, some free food and beverage. 100%. I think you'll get a nice crowd 100%. in there. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, I, I would add that it should also be something that one pays for if it's that good and people are buying it regularly from menu. Why not have it 
available for sale. Now, I don't understand, obviously, the uh, the logistics of, of, well, I understand logistics, but I understand the, the, uh, the way that uh, this particular space is run. If you have area that can be retail space, or at least offer on the menu some items for take home, they should be in a packaging that's similar to, if not exactly like, you want to show it on the shelf. So there'll yeah. be some <clears throat> cost, I think minor, but some cost in buying the type of containers you want to show it in. It may not have the shelf life issues because it won't be going through manufacturing and, and sealing and everything you may want, but it should be in a package that is easy to take home, easy to use, and you will get feedback if these are regular customers that are buying these things, uh, you know, in in a food service setting, and to be able to take it home and uh, and, and try it with their the rest of their family. So I I, I would encourage everybody it's... here to sorry Ken to go to Missy Pasta on on Grand uh, in Williamsburg and see what they're doing there. <clears throat> They've packaged a lot of the stuff that they make at Missy and they make at Lily and they put it on the shelves. You can touch it. You can look at it. You can look at the label. You can buy it. And you can also eat there. So it's just what you're talking about. It's fascinating what they're doing and it's working. They've just opened, but worth a trip. Go ahead. I love Tipu. it. That's it. That's, that's yeah. a perfect example. Uh, you would yeah. think that the same sort of thing should be uh, uh, applied to shelf goods. If you have a space uh, in the restaurant that <laughs> allows you to uh, sell some um, <clears throat> even a, a short range of goods. Some of those should be yours. Uh, and I would think you'd also get a clear idea of what people are willing to spend, um, you know, in, in, in this regard. Uh, and, and you'll get feedback, that's for sure. And that will be how quickly it moves from the shelf. Yep. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a, lo a number of clients here who, who pivoted to uh, a market type concept, um, you know, the, the past couple of years with COVID and things of that nature, who may have pivoted away from that, you know, once once dining reopened. Um, and so it's a great way to explore. I think what's also very important is not just not just getting that product to the customers, but it's also really like if you have regular consumers coming to you all the time for the for the restaurant, exploring with them how they shop what they're looking for, how much they're willing to pay. Like if you said, I've got this container, you know, of, of hummus and it's eight ounces, would you pay $12 for this? You know, it's getting that feedback. And it's because it, it that ties in directly with the research of the marketplace. When you were going out to the marketplace and you're buying every hummus that you can find, every item, every salsa that you can see that's similar to you, to the one you would like to make. And then, so this ties right into that too, where you could, cause it is actually, it's um, I'd say for the restaurant clients on this phone call, it is somewhat challenging for, for other food companies who are, who are, are contemplating getting in that space to get that direct consumer feedback so quickly. And so I would say that you're in a good spot. That's a Take great advantage of it. Big advantage. hundred percent. Okay. You know, Tipu, take so us, take us through the next one. And so with that, you you have the capacity. Um, actually, if we could drop back a little bit. Um, the other one aspect is, is once you're getting feedback from those people whom, with whom you interact regularly, there's the opportunity. In, and especially, again, I'm going to go back to, you know, New York is always a very unique place for many, many issues. And so, again, with the fact that we have um, small grocers spread throughout the city and not just big multinationals like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and things of that nature. There's always the capacity to establish relationships. And David and I, in our first webinars, strongly suggested, and this is never going to change, is that your backyard is your home to get this out to folks initially, you know? And so whether it's local grocery stores in, in your area of New York City or whatever is once you have something, it is then to, to engage with, um, you can engage, and this is something that can be done very easily, right? It, it's not a it's not a big thing. You're not getting on a schedule of a multinationals retailers merchant when they're allowing merchants to submit products and things of that nature, but this allows you to get that feedback from stores that would possibly carry your product. And so I think it's, again, it's a unique thing where in New York, where small still exists here, local still exists very much so, and that you can really get that feedback is important. Great, thank you.
Alex, please next. Thank you. All right. Viability. So again, again, a, a thing we hear, and I think it'll think it'll it's something we will always hear is that people will want to know if I'm going to do this, am I, is it going to work? You know, in a nutshell, that is a that is a very basic material question, and it's the right one to ask. And so this slide is what we're going to go through on the some of the complexities as you are thinking about your product of being a little bit forward thinking here, a little bit farther thinking now about the viability and feasibility of your idea. Um, and so, Ken, you want to take the first one and I'll do, I'll do. I'll absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So this is, this is now going to the stage of, I, I tried something with my, my clientele's family, friends, and, you know, uh, small shops. If you can get that far, that would be great. If it's something that, uh, is easy enough to go from your, uh, approved, uh, 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 kitchen to a shelf in, in small quantity. That's great. Uh, if not, uh, you do have to be concerned with how to get there on the, this next stage. And that is working with a co-packer. They can be quite small or it can be uh, one of the uh, 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 small kitchens that are uh, run throughout various neighborhoods in, in New York that uh, get you up to speed and are, uh, are certified. Um, and that's where you can take something from doing dozens of to doing hundreds of and see how this how the recipe scales how is it replicable do you have uh, many different changes because of the machinery that needs to be used because it's always going to be different than what you have in a bench model uh, but that has to be considered uh, and making that step is the is the next big one um, and that is getting it into production even small production but something that is uh, uh, steady and uh, replicable. Um, that can be done in, in small places, as I noted, within the city or larger spots outside, you know, whether it's Hudson Valley, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, but um, that is, that's the next big step. Here's a question. Uh, Ken, maybe you can take this one. How do you test market CPGs that contain alcohol? Our on-site customers love the product and we've sold many thousands to go during the pandemic, but because of the alcohol content, I think there would be more restrictions. Do you have any experience with that? Uh, un uh, unfortunately, I don't, I do not do, uh, I do have a couple clients in, in the wine industry, but overall I don't do alcohol and I don't know enough about testing within that field. Um, you, can call, uh, you can call us and speak to Joseph Levy, my partner. Uh, we'll take you through it. We know how to do that. We have a couple of clients who actually have some stuff on the shelves, like Via Corroda just bottled uh, a couple of drinks, um, and they had to get a special authorization from the state legislature. But we can talk you through that whole thing. Tipu, why don't you continue? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I here, let me just take that for a quick, to add yeah. a little context to that. I mean, I think regarding testing, yes, with alcohol, of course, you have issues regarding age. But there would be what we've said is nothing necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't actually change it, the answers that we've just given, where you could still test with your customer base locally. With if you're talking about if you have a restaurant, for example, you can still absolutely do that. The only thing that changes is your retail channel, right? So what we've been talking about have been local grocers and things of that nature. And if we're focused on New York, New York has that the anomaly of. Um, you can't sell uh, wine and spirits in the grocery store. So in that capacity, you would have to just seek out, you could seek out, um, you know, uh, retailers that are focused on the wine and spirits area. If you're just talking about New York, you go outside of New York, the rules are different for each state. And so definitely, Dave, the team can help regarding that. But it's just a retail, it's just a retail space that's going to be different. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, um, and then so quickly on, so for regulatory consideration, so I think one of the big things that, that folks, um, think about, and, and everybody seems to have mentioned it to us and, and folks have at least a cursory understanding of it is w the ingredients in your product are going to trigger different rules. And so that is, that's going to be the case and where you sell your product is also going to trigger a different set of rules. 
And this is where things can get pretty complicated regarding uh, CPG. And luckily we can help you through that. Uh, the easiest is if you sell within the state of New York and you wanna keep it local, you tend not, you can follow the rules of New York state. And for, in that capacity, you would end up uh, being prohibited from moving your products out of the state, but it also allows for you to get quickly up and running but it, it, things such as um, nutritional labeling, ingredients, things of that nature may be slightly easier to deal with than having a product that is going out of the state, which is going to trigger FDA rules and regulations regarding that. Um, and that's for most products. The FDA has oversight on overwhelmingly uh, every food product in America, with the exception of meat and poultry and a couple other items, uh, which will trigger the USDA. And so the USDA are the meat guy. They are the meat folks. They are the ones who are have the inspectors in um, abattoirs and uh, butcheries and things and things of that nature. And so the utilization of meat products in I, I'm not deterring anybody from doing this, but what I'm just saying is that it just it's just something to be aware of that when you start u utilizing meat, you'll trigger the USDA. If you end up ultimately using a co-packer who deals in meat, they will be a USDA certified facilities, uh, yes. USDA certified facility. And that's it really, you know, I'm not saying don't do it or, or do it. I think you can always work through for me as a lawyer, I, you always want to just work through these issues. You know, I would never say don't do it. And so that's, but it's just something to consider if you're say on the fence between a, a, a product that is vegetarian or something that might contain meat, uh, that down the road that you'll have to just deal with these issues. Um, yep. and so, that's also, and then ultimately being an FDA approved product is your best solution because it allows you to sell across all 50 states. It takes the whole local aspect off the table and you can be, in, you can be from New York to California without any issue. You have the proper labeling, you have the proper ingredients, you have the proper nutritional statements. And that, that means you can do deals directly with retailers in other states. You can do deals directly with distributors and there's no issue. Are you compliant with what's going on anywhere you are? And so ultimately that's the way to do it. And the, uh, the co-packers, whether meat facilities or traditional co-packers uh, will be able to guide you through a lot of the regulatory issues, help you with labeling and everything else. Uh, but, uh, you should go into those facilities with what we talked about before, and that is what packaging do I want? What is the type of packaging that I'd like to see my product in? Uh, so you go in with a clear idea. Those things, almost everything will change as you move up uh, and, and change the way you build your goods or manufacture your goods, but you should go in with a clear idea of how you'd like to, to see it on the shelf. And of course, in what area in the shop, whether it's refrigerated or uh, in, in grocery. Um, and I've worked in uh, uh, USDA facilities before I've, with my own businesses for 20 years. Uh, so and I've, I've uh, worked in three or four. It is not that difficult once you start. You just have to have your, your paperwork in order. Um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward from there. And if you're a smaller part of a larger operation, um, most of it will be taken care of by management with some uh, input by you, but otherwise it's not, uh, it's not too scary. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. if you ultimately use a co-packer, they will be the facility that's registered either with the FDA or with the USDA, possibly with both. And so that the one, the, the area that you as the brand would want to ensure that you're comfortable with is that when you visit or select a co-packer, that they are compliant with all of these things and that their certifications are in place, that the facility is clean, they're following all the rules and they're doing all that because they're the ones who hold that certification, which is gonna allow you to have your product have its certifications. And so that's an that's an always an important aspect. And today it's not focused super on, on, on co-packers, but again, a co just like we've said, uh, the point of view is ultimately super important about your brand. And that person with whom you choose to make your product is also gigantically important decision. Let's no, talk about that is, um, that is huge. Yeah. Let's let's talk about how much money it costs 
at this initial stage. So you've identified a product, you're into it, you figure it out, maybe uh, through your clientele that they're liking it. And now you want to start to, to move. You want to start to make your next move. How do you fund that? How much does it cost? What is your next move? So we can take this in, in various stages. Let, let, let's make the assumption at this point that uh, I'm ready to go forward. I'm, I'm going to make this product. Uh, you have looked at some of the facilities, seen what um, attributes uh, that they, they have, what certifications they have, and uh, uh, have decided to you know, uh, uh, go forward. Uh, the major thing at this point is going to see them. And so, you know, you, you're going to work that way and you'll have an idea. You'll have a, essentially a menu from them of what they'll do at what stage. Um, so this is um, the, where you have to start spending some funds, but not an awful lot. Um, this could be a matter of a few thousand dollars to make sure you have both first uh, bench samples made uh, that are as close to your idea of what this product should be in their facility. And you will notice that, that things will change. And, and uh, uh, in some places you can be side by side, but in many you cannot be in the same uh, facility with them in the same room uh, at the same time, but have to give them clear direction about what to do. Uh, and that's why visiting the facility is a, is a major thing. So the bench samples uh, will be, as I noted, somewhere between two to five thousand dollars to get down the road uh, to the point of uh, uh, a, a final product within this facility. What do you get for uh, your two to five thousand dollars? So you you it's, get it's, 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 them it's, it's, to you get you get them to work. Usually, it's within three stages. It's to do a, a, a first test within, you know, uh, almost like a restaurant setting, then moving up to larger uh, mechanical uh, product uh, projects uh, with, uh, with larger uh, uh, mixing vessels, blending vessels and such, uh, before you get into a production run. Um, so for those few thousand dollars, you'll get to the stage just before production. If you want to get into a production run, uh, one that you're not going to be selling initially as you have pre orders, but typically the first production run does not go into sales. So you that product would be, again, giveaways and such, right? You're, so you're, before you're you go testing. into production, Ken, before you go into production, you're getting a product that is going to taste as close as you can imagine to what's going to be on the shelf. Is that right? That's the idea. And you don't, you try not to move forward into the next stage until it's necessary. And that necessary stage is, this is exactly what I want. And yes, that's the container it works in because there's going to be lots of things about how does it get filled? Uh, am I using a pump? I'm using gravity fill. Is it going to be an emulsified product? Do I want to maintain texture? So it's going to be a slower operation. There's different things that will be used and, Again, that's why you have to have to have a clear idea of what the product should be at the end. Um, show this, test samples of things they've done before if they're doing the same kind of product. Um, and moving up is typically three stages. Is it common to try to get that bench sample and then not like it and try to go to another co-packer? Well, another, yeah, can you that, take that, that and go that to another co-packer and less say, efficient. hang on, if, can you go to another co-packer and say, I like everything about this, except I don't like the texture. Can you change that and have those kinds of meetings and then try you can have else? some. You can have some of that answered before you go into a co-packer because the discussions you'll have first will be just like this on a Zoom call and you will discuss exactly what your product is like. They will have in their hands your product that you made in your restaurant, in your kitchen, wherever that might be. And uh, they'll say, how did you do this? We have this, we don't have that. So uh, having the right equipment, having the right mindset, and having, um, th th there has to be a good um, uh, sort of, 
uh, you have to like who you're dealing with. It yes. should be someone who has the same sort of mindset you do. And right. he's also on this path of uh, a, uh, a better than product. It should not be a place you go into and feel uncomfortable. You should feel some sympathetical here. It should, it should, you should have this person working with you, not just for you. 100%. It's a partnership. It's an extremely important partnership. Um, because that, they, they, are the, they are the guys who are going to be last touching your product. Do you want to know that they they have that same idea that you have about the quality level that has to go out? There's, there should be any no shortcut. So the you, you get to a point where you got a product you like, you spent a few thousand, then you said you have to do a first run which is usually giveaways. Are those when you say giveaways, do you mean when you're going out? I to would not suggest so once you do once you do the first run, and many places will have either two stages or three stages with the production, meaning you can produce five hundred pounds of product or two thousand or five thousand pounds of X. Mm. Um, the 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 first one uh, will you'll be taking a chance if you go from the second stage of testing right into production and say, I'm going to get this into Whole Foods because you may run into trouble that you don't understand. So, so you do a minimum. It's a, safe, it's a safety measure. That is, that is your, you have to have some luxury of time and dollars in order to do this. What is a typical first run? Minimum, minimum, minimum. Uh, first run in production, 500, about 500 units. 500 units. Okay. And you can take those and, and move them around however you want. Give them away, you know, use them as samples, depending on the shelf life, of course. Uh, if it's if it's perfect, that's great. And just store them away. And let's say it has a month shelf life, you, you should be giving those away quickly. If it has six months, you have a good amount of time to use them for uh, other people you want to sell to. Um, but, uh, you have to be sure that, uh, little has changed, but as all of us understand, if we're in the food business, everything changes. If you move from one room to the next with the same equipment, something changes. It's, you know, it's not always magic, but it's something will change. And, and if you're changing a machine, a machine and scaling it up, changing speed, anything could have an impact on the final goods. And you have to be aware of that. And that first run, that test run, you're using your own packaging. I'm assuming that the labeling would be fully fitted out also at that point. Yeah, at this stage, at this stage, all your your artwork, your packaging, um, the boxes it goes in, anything and everything should be shelf ready. This is that's that the cost of getting to that stage is making sure that you are prepared to make this onto a shelf. So there's no shortcut at this point. That, that that's, the, that's the cost of doing business is getting prepared. And before you can sell it, you better be ready. So theoretically, you're spending, let's call it five grand to get this to this point, to the first run. And then you're out there selling to grocers and then grocers are ordering and then you're doing a real run after this, right? You could be doing several smaller runs, meaning the, the, the first stage before you move up. Um, again, depending on, on your, your approach to sales, am I going to start only in neighborhood shops? Am I going to try to get a larger uh, uh, multi-unit group? Um, if you do that, you're looking at several months down the line. We were not going to go all the way down this 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 rabbit hole, but if you're looking no. at uh, going into, you know, Stop and Shop, Whole Foods, uh, any any number of the the fresh market, uh, Wegmans, uh, you'll you need to be prepared. And typically, they're going to be working six to eight months in advance. So even if you got an order or you had it approved today, you would not have an order and product on the shelf for, you know, six months. That's good to know. Tipu. Yeah. So that's where you, you. Can, you, you can do your smaller runs. And this is where you're you're sort of opening out of town, right? Actually opening in town, but you're, you're opening outside the larger players by working with the independents. And that's where we have a real benefit. Being here, it's great to do that, whether it's 
you know, any number of stories, whether it's, it's, it's Zabar's East Side, West Side, or you're looking at, uh, you know, any number of, of independents. There's it's a, a lot of places to go, and where it's yeah. good. And, and it's all throughout the Northeast. Thank yeah. you. I think you want to keep us moving with the, with your. Yep. Outline. I think one, one thing I think that's important regarding everything that was stated is that um, there is, so I think not treating it like a side hustle is an important thing to put your focus and to make sure that you do all these steps in kind of a conscious phased way yields the best result, definitely, especially with these type of products in an industry that is um, somewhat traditional. The grocery industry is a relatively traditional industry. Uh, it follows a cadence and seasonality regarding products um, that come in to their stores. And so being conscious of, of, of that, recognizing that, I think goes to the statement that is on this, this slide about planning one to two years of capital before you're necessarily a to produce your products right but also in order to you're going to have to self fund this before money starts coming in and so the conservative approach would be to plan one to two years of capital needed if you're supporting yourself through another means right say through a restaurant or your other businesses that's great but then funding the business for what it needs is an important aspect i will say that people have asked us how can you what types of funding is there? How can I get money? And so what I will say is that untested brands have a hard time securing money from financial service companies. So this is the venture capital thing, venture capital firms that people read about um, and things of that nature. You need to be a somewhat either tested commodity or a huge brand that they know that their risk is low going into market. Um, and so that is, um, those are, they are certainly available, but you need to be a little bit farther down the road to start securing that. These are the types of businesses who want to fund things that are in the market, but they're looking to juice them up and they're looking to expand them or a brand that exists that's struggling to scale, but is doing really great in New York city, for example. And so the typical sources I would say are no different than what people may go and find regarding initially for a restaurant, you know, so that is the classic friends and family and things of that nature or, or self-funding initially. Um, you know, obviously any, I don't have to say to this crowd, anytime you seek outside investors, they take a piece of your piece of your action. Yeah. And so, may, you know, may I add one thing, Tipo? Yeah, of course. Uh, and that is I have clients that uh, are, are reluctant to go into the retail end first. They want to start with independence that we spoke with and food service. Uh, so there isn't the same issue with packaging and labeling and uh, everything else because you're dealing in bulk. Um, and that is another avenue. If you have a product that can go into food service, that's a way to defer some of the costs and have immediate uh, capital flow that you can have income uh, by staying within the food service arena at first because you don't have some of those same costs and, and roadblocks and you have immediate sales. Uh, and I'll jump on that too, direct to consumer. And so that's also a, a third category of setting up a website, setting up e-commerce site. Um, and you granted, you have to deal with shipping, but there's many companies that handle the logistics of shipping regarding food today. Right. And you, can, yeah. uh, you can do that as well. Yeah. And, you and I, I, I'm dealing, so in that regard, I'm dealing with, a company that is now that uh, is uh, importing product has good sales through, as you noted, through Amazon. They're they're top rated within their group. Um, uh, I've gotten them into food service because that's an easier avenue with some things. And now we're starting to get traction within retail. Uh, so his his major investment in this case, this is you know not domestic. He had to invest in warehousing space. And to have someone here, and he opened an office just to do fulfillment. So there are other avenues to have income uh, besides getting into the larger retailers. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Alex, I think we can turn to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I think what what we're going to talk about here is, a, it, and we've kind of blended it with the last slide a little bit. But what we're going to talk about is now the kind of you. You've reached through, gone through the idea. You have a great product. 
you have uh it's becoming a reality and we're just going to talk about what what real means and we've talked touched on some of this stuff and we'll go through each one um because these are all the various factors that go into a completed product um and so we'll talk about that in that capacity and so first thing we we did talk about is processing and so the making of your product um i think from there are two choices roughly two choices when it comes to processing or manufacturing a product one is through the third party contract packaging space co-packers um the second is to do it yourself and so that would mean, and here, let's talk about the second one first. Uh, that is either renting a space, uh, purchasing a space, in addition to funding your own employees to make your products. And so um, for most companies that are starting new, this is an exorbitant cost to take on uh, to manufacture, uh, whether it's a sauce, uh, pasta, what have you. Uh, especially in the New York area where, where we're focused with real estate and labor being very high, this can be an exceptionally high cost. It is certainly doable and you can absolutely, a person can make a production kitchen that meets uh, FDA requirements uh, relatively easily actually, and you can then do it yourself. Um, and so for most folks, we would probably advise against that where because there's basically the secondary industry that is completely um, existent here. It's, there are many opportunities. There are small scale co-packers in the New York state, and then there are large scale co-packers spread around the Northeast for folks to utilize as well. Um, and so I think manufacturing, as we talked about, and Ken can go into this, is uh, a partnership. And so what have you seen with co-packers, Ken? Uh, I have not gone down the road of, of uh, uh, partnership with the co-packer. Um, of course, that's possible. They have to believe in the product, but typically they want something that they can use their best skills at, and that is an in and an out to make, make you know, get the products, raw materials in and, and ship out the, the, uh, uh, the finished product. Um, but right here, uh, as we noted earlier in New York, you can go into the small test kitchens to do smaller runs. I know several businesses that have done just that. Um, uh, I also know of one that you've made note of sauce companies. There's one in Brooklyn that's actually doing quite well and now does um, uh, national distribution uh, is, is very well known. Uh, he started in his in his, uh, his basement kitchen and then took over a... a uh, an adjacent uh, uh, catering space. Uh, but uh, there are many smaller um, uh, co-mans throughout the region. Um, Hudson Valley, as I noted, right over the, the, the river in Jersey and such, um, and will gladly pull uh, uh, you know, better quality products, interesting uh, 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 products that would be uh, going into the natural space. I think there's more of that in this region than any other. Um, and I, I know of others in uh, further outside the, the region that will do larger manufacturing and you don't need to start that way. Um, but I have not gone through a, a situation where there was a partnership of the manufacturer or the co-manufacturer in this, this case and the, uh, 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 and the client. Uh, I'm sure it happens. Um, I have not been involved in that kind of uh, uh, partnership. Yeah, and I think, um, and I think where you can see that is some some food accelerators do partner. They do partner. They 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 take a stake in uh, your product, uh, and some of those have their own manufacturing facilities where, in exchange for an equity position, they will then help you. Um, create your brand and manufacture it in that capacity. Um, packaging, I think we've, we've touched on packaging throughout this discussion because it, it's one of the key ingredients, it's one of the key components of, of the product. And I think when folks are looking for, um, when they're considering their product, it's as essential to consider packaging in a few ways. One is the capacity to stand out with your packaging. Um, is it a 
bottle or a package that is traditionally not used with your product, for example? Are you doing something in a novel way that people could appreciate? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cite, uh, and I think we've all seen it recently, which has made a pretty big impact in, in an industry, in a, in a category that we think doesn't really change too much, Garza olive oil, uh, which comes in a squeeze bottle. Uh, a simple squeeze bottle, uh, as opposed to um, a metal container or a glass bottle, has made a pretty big impact in the olive oil space uh, over the past, you know, couple of years. And I think uh, anybody who's seen it, it's the green bottle, uh, comes in like a 15 ounce and like a 25 ouncer. Uh, but that was taking olive oil, which there are many, many varieties in a store, and putting it into a different packaging that has had an impact. And so I think that shows you, again, just having a clear point of view on something can make all the difference in a category that we would all say like, man, that olive oil is played out, but it wasn't at all. And Garza has been doing great. Um, yeah. So I think that that's very interesting. I think, Ken, if you want to talk about packaging restrictions, though, when it comes to perhaps like co-packers, like you can't just do anything you want. No, and this is this is a real issue within co-packing. Uh, that's why you have to come to the table with a clear idea of how you want this product to not taste uh, and and show on the shelf. Um, otherwise, you'll be taken down another path of what someone else wants. So make sure that you have a, a clear idea of, uh, and you've seen some packaging, whether you know through uh, a website you find on on uh, uh, you know online or otherwise, but know what that packaging uh, should be for your type of product that shows it off well and maintains its integrity. Um, uh, that is, that, that's key. Packaging will make or break a product uh, quite easily. And you, you've made a point of olive oil. That is, as you know, I'm, I'm deep in the olive oil biz and on, on various, uh, with various products from uh, at this point, three different countries, four different countries. And, um, that is a, a, the only way um, to at least get the first impression on the shelf is to show off well, because there's so much competition in that space and you have to get past the buyer. Uh, and so it's not always so, so much about what's inside you know, what what the guts are of this thing, but, you know, what it's wearing. It's a it's a big deal. Super important. Um, nutritional. So nutrition goes back to our very first slide that we were talking about when we're talking about ingredients. Um, and so when this focus has been on products that, that you know, if, if your product is not good for anybody and it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily health focused, um, or if it is a better for you product, um, or it is something that you want to say is in fact healthy or something that works in the wellness space, nutrition is going to be extremely important that ultimately your product is hitting the metrics that are going to be acceptable for either your claims or for your consumers. And so that's going to be really important when it comes to that. Nutrition is getting increasingly easy to test. Uh, I'd say like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you would have had to use third party labs uh, to send a sample of your product to run it and which you can still 100% is still available today and they're absolutely around. But now it's uh, whether you are testing something in your restaurant space or at home, you can input uh, nutrition into uh, online, um, online services that will give you back a rough nutrition without actually testing it. And so you can find out very easily if you have a focus on health, wellness, calorie counts, uh, carbs, proteins, fats, anything of that nature. And it's not a single ingredient like olive oil, for example, that you know that you are um, in the ballpark or that you are you can easily start tweaking your product to do that. With a co-packer, um, if you're using a co-packer, they will also be able to help you with, um, that's one of their aspects is being able to help their clients with nutrition. Um, but nutrition is, uh, it's, it's uh, as big as your brand, your brand statements on the front of your package. And it's as, you know, it's uh, it's one of the very, there's about three or four items that are on a product package. And this is one of them. 
And so being within the ballpark and hitting your metrics is, is very important, but it is, it is easy. I would say it's the easiest to do now than it ever has been to get you rough numbers. No, that's, that's absolutely true. It's, it's plug and play with the nutritional now, uh, although this should be uh, finalized with, uh, with a lab once it goes to ready to go to market, but you'll have a, a, a good ballpark shelf life should be done in the lab uh, that they will give you the, the best idea about what real shelf life is. Uh, and that's not very costly, but it is uh, a, a small cost that you should bear in order to know exactly what uh, your product uh, shelf life is and, and can share with the uh, retailer. 100%. And shelf life also, not just for from, from the safety perspective of when your product will potentially go bad, but also shelf life in relation to your selection of where you feel your product would want to be. So shelf life is also related to the location in the grocery store. Um, Ken, you want to talk about talk about the grocery and uh, shell, uh, frozen versus fresh versus uh, ambient? Sure. So uh, typically uh, products are, are more easily rotated in and out within grocery. Uh, shelf stable products uh, are, are just an easier sell overall. Uh, refrigerated goods get a little tougher. Uh, what we think of as a dairy case because the dairies uh, within uh, supermarkets are running very, very tight, meaning they need 40% more space than they have. So a lot of space has been taken uh, from other departments. You'll see uh, end caps uh, near produce. You'll see areas that are uh, freestanding cases uh, near the bakery or near other fresh departments like uh, meat or seafood, just to take uh, a little bit of pressure off the uh, the traditional dairy case. Um, so it's this has really come to the fore uh, in the past few years during pandemic where fresh was king. Uh, and fresh, uh, organic, vegan would just it just exploded during uh, this time. And it's continuing. Tipo mentioned earlier how some things are coming off a bit, but overall the trajectory is up. It's, the, the, what's needed is more space in, in fresh uh, and more products in the space that is about alternative uh, type of products in, in uh, all regard. But uh, so just to some easier in grocery, not as easy in dairy. Freezer, I think you have a good amount of, of play because uh, any new product that is better than, um, more innovative, is going to be seen uh, in a, a very uh, good light. Yep. And I think at, uh, um, and all of that will be done. And all, all those products, regardless of where they are, including Ambient and the center of the store, they all will require shelf life. And it is true, get going straight to the lab and figuring out your your the maximum goodness, if you will, of your product is 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 you, is something you will just have to do. It's part of the um, it's it's just a legal requirement essentially. Um, which one other thing, Atipo, about uh, about shelf life, and that is uh, as you noted, you you I think you made the point, but I I do want to reiterate, it's not about when this is 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 can't be eaten it's when it should be so you want product to be showing well when someone has it within your shelf life range it it shouldn't be tired or loses vitality or the aromatics are gone you should have your shelf life at the end point is best eaten by because it is still the highest quality that you want to deliver totally 100 percent um Food safety. Food safety is actually really important. And I think this goes to the relationship that somebody will have with their co-packer ultimately or their manufacturer. Um, food safety. Um, you always want to be working in a clean facility. You want a clean facility. You want your products to be free of um, everything from metal metal parts. We, Ken and I have seen everything in products uh, that have inadvertently been put in them. Uh, due to sometimes simply an accident or sometimes also uh, poor manufacturing practices. And so uh, I can't overstate that I that your brand can live and die by one incident. 
Um, and so it's just as you think through it and you start partnering or meeting with co-packers that when you walk into a facility, you know that their their food products are safe and that they care about that. I think that that to, to me is always really important is that you actually care about um, food safety and that they follow it. Um, kind of seems like a obvious statement, but it's kind of surprising at times what you'll see um, in this industry. And so I think that's that's really important. And that kind of also just goes back to kind of the theme of our discussion is that when you're aiming for quality products, you'll tend to partner and work with quality vendors. And um, and I think it ends up resulting in a better product. Um, and and uh, uh, Tipa would, again, to, to sort of reiterate this thing on, on food safety, I've been in facilities, worked with uh, uh, manufacturers on various levels. I remember one very clearly uh, it was a, a new facility for um, for packing nuts and snack mixes for Fresh Direct when I was working with them. Uh, and they had everything. It was the cleanest facility. It was newly built. They had great metal detectors. They could show you how they all worked. Unfortunately, not everyone knew how to turn on the switch. So you had things that, that were in place that weren't being used that could cause you real harm. So... Um, uh, GMPs, good you know, big deal. yes. And, and having a trained staff. And that is an issue these days with having, if, if you run a restaurant, you know, this yourself, getting people who come in, who know how to do the work is not so easy. Yep. So it's just something to be aware of as, you know, I think it's always really important, just like, um, you know, I think especially today with social media, and the fact that the public can have very quickly a voice that can turn something viral. I think food safety is supremely important to make sure that your brand always maintains its best PR footprint, period. Um, I think regarding cause, I think we've gone gone through this, so I don't want to belabor it again. I think we've, we've done that, but that's been, if there are additional questions, we're happy to take them. We have around, roughly around 10 minutes. Um, and so, but that is, uh, kind of what we wanted to talk about today was to give folks some foundational comfort in approaching this and to really feel comfortable in tackling a CPG product and that it's totally you doable. Guys... <clears throat> Sorry, Tipu. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I, I, I want you to, to wrap up. I hate to interrupt someone when they're wrapping up. No, but I think it's, it, I think you're in a great, I think we are very fortunate. Uh, we all know that New York City can be a pain in the ass, uh, but we, uh, we are in a great area where you have a welcoming audience, welcoming markets, um, media, uh, and everything that is kind of attuned to always seeking something new, you know? And so fully encourage folks, if you're thinking about it, to take advantage of it um, and do it. Thank you. And thank you, Ken. That was enlightening, interesting, fascinating, really. Uh, we're here for another 10 minutes or so. If you want to ask a specific question about your product, go ahead. If you just want to ask a general question, <clears throat> feel free. Uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to type, think, send, and then we will uh, answer your questions. In the meantime, Ken, what's the most exciting product you've seen on the shelves recently? Oh, my goodness. Um, I would say that um, I, I go for sort of uh, traditional stuff and having looking at what's come onto the market that is just uh, uh, some better than products. Um, now, I was I was as Tipo mentioned about the olive oil, I was, I was amazed how quickly that was picked up. And I'm sure a lot of people in the restaurant business said, I use squeeze bottles for the last 20 years. What's going on with this? But that getting it into the kitchen was a, was a, was a big deal, right? Getting into the home was a big deal. Uh, I'd say that I, I'm, I look at uh, things that are, uh, uh, I'm focusing now on, on the fishes in the, in the, in the supermarket. And I like what I see in, uh, just better quality uh, uh, jarred and canned fishes that are coming to the fore. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot more uh, that's happening within a space that is uh, uh, sort of bringing things in that are iconic, 
in other cultures, but are newer here. Um, and I like seeing things uh, in the condiment uh, space, uh, especially uh, things that are Middle Eastern and such uh, that are coming into mainstream uh, supermarkets. So there's lots of things within that space I, I like very much. My wife would be more excited about the the uh, the snacks, like the uh, the uh, the traditional uh, uh, roasted corn snacks uh, that uh, you see the sort of Mexican in in, in base. Uh, so uh, depends on your point of view, but there's lots of stuff out there that is just I think uh, uh, really quite exciting. And the the more adventurous is what I see is in uh, uh, in the vegan space. Uh, there's a product out there that is uh, done with cultured um, uh, uh, milk from uh, from millet, right? Buttermilk from millet, um, as opposed to traditional buttermilk, using that as a base for uh, drinks and for dressings. So there's all sorts of things out there that, uh, uh, you know, excite me. Uh, it's a lot of stuff happening all at once. Here's a question for you guys. Thank you, Ken. Uh, for your conversations with small grocery stores, when you're having the initial conversations with the buyer store owner, should you have everything buttoned up, meaning where you will manufacture the product, or is it possible to have them taste the homemade product? You can have them taste the homemade product. That's not a problem with the independents. They're going to be more forgiving. They like that, that you're in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, you should be ready to have a, a small manufacturing done, whether that's, you know, as people Tipu noted in, uh, you know, a, 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 a local uh, facility you can you can rent. Um, but uh, no, you don't have to have everything buttoned up. You you can go in there, as, as I did many years ago with my products when I was doing charcuterie items, you know, thirty years ago, and and walk in with my little package and show this or that that's uh that, that's a given you can you can you can uh, feel free to f be comfortable with the independence thank you well i i think um we don't have any more questions so i'm going to thank you again ken thank you tipu thank you all for attending the webinar we've got a bunch more in our fall webinar schedule you can email us about that if you haven't gotten our emails already and call us if you have any questions about CPG. We're always happy to answer questions. You can email me directly or Tipu directly. And um, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tipu. We appreciate it.